From the 2018 Inform News Media Summit, this is a special edition of Paul Murray Live. Can I talk into a microphone, technical people? Hello. Uh, yes, hello everyone. My name's Paul Murray, otherwise known as the fat guy from The Hangover, kind of Kyle Sandilands if you squint. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much to, uh, to Tiki and to Hugh. I want to introduce you to uh, three people who've got plenty to say and I want to give you the opportunity to ask them questions as well. Of course, from the Australian newspaper, none other than Paul Whitaker. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Welcome Tori Maguire from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. And Brett McCarthy from the West Australian. Give it up for him. <laughs> Even clapping, good. That's the room that's now been established. Uh, there's a lot I want to get to about uh, where all of your businesses are at the moment and where uh, they sit in everything from sort of the online attack culture through to how your subscription world is working. But, Paul, I think uh, the biggest thing in the past 12 months that's an example about how uh, a, an established news brand can go and do something new and then potentially um, get one hell of a result is, of course, Teacher's Pet. Uh, the idea that 18 million people have downloaded it is amazing. Um, you may have told the story many times before, but for those that haven't heard it in the room, does Headley walk in and say, I've got an idea, or does someone from the ideas factory uh, bring forward an idea from the whiteboard and it gets workshopped and then you go, uh. Headley? Uh, well, it's actually at about 19.3 million, but uh, it's, Sorry. Uh, it's growing at about 30,000 an hour. It's quite ph uh, phenomenal. But uh, well, so how it basically happened was Headley uh, came to see me and said that he, th he wanted to try his hand at podcasting. And I said, yeah, we've done one, which was quite successful. Uh, how long do you want? He said, well, look, I'll need at least six months off to do it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and within a few months of starting it, uh, he... Um, then he wanted uh, a small team of sound and audio people. Um, and the reality of podcasting is that the technical requirements and the polish that uh, these productions now have to have is sort of rivaling uh, the same sort of production standards that are happening in Hollywood. So you can't just turn the tape recorder on and, uh, and run it up the pole. You actually have to uh, think about the scripting of it, you have to think about the sound quality that you use. Um, one thing is Headley's voice sounds quite mellifluous. Um, uh, that's the magic of a fellow called Slade Gibson who used to be the lead guitarist in uh, Savage Garden and he is literally a rock star. And he manages to take all the ums and ahs and hesitations out and make Headley sound like Walter Cronkite. That's cool. Uh. It's, when, what's what was the expectation of it, that it was going to be like a, an S-Town or a serial and it's, it's this true crime thing that would have that appeal or is there a journalistic endeavour that Headley was trying to do which was to get them to look at it again? Well, I mean, the big surprise in this podcast was usually someone produces, uh, you know, maybe six episodes written and it's in the can and then it starts playing. What, what happened with this one was once Headley had the first episode out, he was just overwhelmed by the public, by ex-students at the school, by people who knew something. And I think that's the, that's the very interesting thing about podcasting. We could have started this story only in the newspaper and I don't think a lot of those people would have ever rung us. I think once they heard other people talking about it, they said, I know something about that and I want to add my voice to this process. So what was very unique about this podcast was it was live and it was happening week in, week out. Headley was writing 15,000 words a week. Wow. I mean, which it, it almost killed him. It almost killed all of us uh, in the process. But, um, you know, I have to say he, he pulled it off magnificently. Tori, these... I'm just trying to use... Avoid the wank words, everyone, OK? <laughs> I hate new platforms. I hate all of that. Like, just... So forgive the bogan for trying to find ways around it. But... In terms of new platforms, um, <laughs> do, how do you see the ability to use things like, uh, like audio, like video, to be able not just to add to the existing text of the newspaper or the website, but to actually become the thing that drives all of the logic around, well, what's in the paper today? What's the news today? For it to become its own thing with its own energy. 
I see it as both a huge opportunity and a huge risk because, as Paul said, the resources that have to go into something like that are enormous and um, coming from a print and online straight text background, used to being able to have an idea, execute it and have it in front of the audience, if not you know, in the next couple of hours online, at least the next day in the newspaper. The um, planning and sheer hours of labour that have to go into doing something much simpler. You know, we've done podcasts that are much less comprehensive and challenging than Teacher's Pet, and it takes many, many people almost full-time to produce them. And so it is a great way... Our, our audiences are all telling us unanimously that they want um, deeper engagement with our journalists and with our stories, and that they want to get to the bottom of stories rather than just have this fire hose of information coming at them. But it's very hard to produce, and it's also very hard to get people to get sponsorship behind them. I don't know if you had a sponsor for Teachers well, Pet from the I, beginning. I know you do now. But well, just maybe just a small thing I can add there. Obviously, a room of advertisers. I think uh, there's a lot of. I think the market's quite immature in Australia. And uh, the thing that advertisers have to remember is 75% of the people that are listening to the True Crime podcast, particularly this one about a mother of two that goes missing and vanishes, is that uh, women are listening to these podcasts. So we went to uh, a bunch of advertising agencies who basically said, look, we're worried about you know, brand damage, potentially about being associated with that. And in the end, the only person who took it up was Katie Page. And you know what? She got a fantastic result, way, <laughs> way above what she'd ever anticipated. Was that before you launched? Sorry, Paul. Uh, that was... You can ask, I don't mind. <laughs> that was the day after we launched. Um, uh, but the thing about it was, too, is the other side of that equation is CPM. So, uh, you know, you have to get large-scale audience to get roughly $120 in terms of pre-roll, mid-roll and post-roll. When it hit number one in the United States, we suddenly had interest from advertisers who wanted to be part of it. Under the podcast model, it can be geofenced in terms of Australia and other jurisdictions. And obviously, America is, uh, is uh, the biggest part of our audience uh, now and growing. So uh, there, are, there is opportunity to commercialise it, but to Tory's point, it is very expensive. I've taken out the very best journalist in our, uh, in our newspaper, if not the country, um, for nine months. Um, not to mention the audio, the, the, uh, the sound, the travel, the transcription of thousands of hours. It's a big, big undertaking. The best, way, the best way for it to work, though, is if you then get content extracted back out, back out of it. So, you know, you get plenty of front page stories out of Teacher's Pet. We, you know, we had a really good podcast lately called Wrong Skin, which was brilliant and performed by non-Teacher's Pet standards really well. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly got blown out of the water. But it, was, it created a lot of really good stories for our newspapers. Well, and, and it's that thing too, Brett, where, again, things like... Um, you know, an interview series uh, on the website or something like uh, like a podcast. It feels to me like that's the next evolution and potentially, this is what I wanted to ask, do you see it as an eventual replacement for the analysis part of your week in putting out a newspaper where, you know, the Saturday paper is always the thick one because that's, you know, the long and wordy look back at this, that and the other, but the truth is that as, say, the New York Times with The Daily or, um, you know, Slate with some of their stuff, that there's a place to put that content rather than the, the once-a-week thick version of the paper? I, I think both will exist. Um, and, look, I, I wouldn't mind saying something about Teacher's Pet and, you know, looking at it from the outside completely you know, and from the other side of the country. Uh, and not, not that Boris wouldn't, you know, hasn't talked it up, but uh, I think he's probably been a little bit modest even in, in what he said today because, look, at the core of what Sorry. that is... Uh, is probably the finest piece of journalism I've ever seen. Uh, it is just absolutely brilliant journalism, and I think that that is the important bit of this. Uh, yes, it was delivered in a different way. Uh, yes, it, uh, you know, there were great stories in, in print online, and the podcast is just engaging and brilliant in its own way. Um, and, yeah, and Headley's voice uh, even sounds good. But... Um, it, it is just a, a magnificent piece of journalism. I think it's the sort of thing as, uh, as an industry, uh, and I've certainly said to people in my newsroom, you know, have a look at this, consume every bit of it, understand how good it is. Uh, if this doesn't win the Gold Walkley, um, I, I think that uh, the, the Walkley organisation uh, will, 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 should be embarrassed by it. I, I really do. I, I, can't, I can't envisage something right now that will knock this off. So if Headley doesn't get another one, 
uh, I think it'll be an absolute disgrace. Um, you just made sure we won't get it, mate. Well, I hope I, <laughs> I, hope I haven't. Yeah. I hope yeah. I haven't. But, but uh, there's a pretty good photo of a Sheila Haru, the Deputy Prime Minister. Well, um, <laughs> that, that, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. But as a, as, a, as a single piece of journalism and I say an extensive time. piece, it is uh, just a, a magnificent thing. It's proved, you know, it, it should prove a lot of things to our industry of what you can actually do. And, which, sorry. Well, no, I was going to say, which brings me to, to, to the editorial people that are in the room, which is, if you look at a Headley, if you look at a Kate McClymont, it feels like the most valuable people, some of the most valuable people in the newsroom are the people who the audience will perceive as being the lone wolf. And I say that in that there's... I think that one of the most corrosive factors in, in, in uh, information or news is when you end up becoming too much of an ecosystem, i.e. Um, sports reporters generally uh, will tell a story to a certain level, but it's the outsider who comes in and will expose the fundamental corruption of the system. Political reporters who live in Canberra all day long can take you so far, but it's the fly-in, fly-out who turns around and says, I don't care, I'm not going out to dinner with you. Um, how do you seek to empower, Brett, the to identify and empower the future lone wolf of your newsroom? Uh I think a lot, of it's, it, a lot of it's giving people time and freedom to do stuff, and that's where we've all been challenged, I think, uh, over recent years, because there are all these different uh, um, platforms and, and, and ways that we distribute content, and, and obviously our newsrooms have all got smaller over, the, uh, over time. So uh, finding, those, finding those people uh, and allowing them to, 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 to go and have time, and you know, it's a brave decision to, to let someone say it'll take me six to nine months to do something, but uh, it'll be good. And, and look, at the end of it, it it, it might have been one of those stories that, uh, you know, uh, this hasn't really worked. It didn't come up like I wanted and it wasn't quite as good as, you know, a great result for that one. But you have to be able to take those risks. You have to be able to say, well, you, yeah, go and do it. Um, because to me, Tori, it, it feels like at a time when, and I know the buzzword is trust, but at a time when th there seems to be that disconnect and it comes in lots of different ways from the Trump side of things to the ultra-lefty side of things about that trust in the media, that the lone wolf in the newsroom who doesn't seem to be of the thing they are reporting on seems to me to be one of the most magnetic things to keep people locked in, not just sort of talking to the, the club, whatever that club is. And it's about priorities, because at the Herald and the Age, through all of the challenges of the last couple of years about the size of the staffing, the one thing that's never been sacrificed is the quite big investigations team. So there's... Oh, thanks. <laughs> and they're here today. I've only been there a few <laughs> Thank you, Kate. I'm glad you're here. Um, so, we, I mean, there, there's a whole list of names that work across the Herald and the Age, including Kate, including, you know, Baker and McKenzie. Of course. And, and People do recognise those names, and those people are given the freedom and the backing and the huge um, legal investment that it takes to allow them to do their jobs. And it shows in the, you know, in the newspapers themselves, in the breaking stories, and people do respond to it, and not just the audience, but young journos. We're currently recruiting a whole heap of trainees, and my favourite question to them is always, who are your favourite journos? And nine times out of ten, they name one of the investigation's stars. What do you think about that identify? How you identify the next Headley? Headley is obviously uh, quite unique, mm. um, and but there are obviously only a handful of journalists who can operate at that level. I mean, to write 15,000 coherent words, brilliant words a week, I mean, that is mm. an amazing uh, thing to be able to do. Mm. Um, and there's not many journalists who could have pulled it off, but Headley is certainly one of them. On the issue of trust, I think this is a bit of a misnomer that, you know, uh, that, uh, that there's a trust problem in the media. Um, you know, everyone on this panel every journalist in this room, we don't publish fake news. Um, we haven't published it, we don't publish it now. Um, we verify what we publish, we authenticate what we publish, we give people the right of reply. If we make a mistake, we try to correct it in a timely fashion. We're subject to the laws of defamation and a whole multitude of other laws that go along with that. Uh, we're also subject to review by an independent press council. Um, the people that publish fake news are Facebook. They publish fake news, they disseminate it, they monetize it. They rank it next to real news, and then somehow, I mean, there's been a conference this week in Tasmania, which was, how do we um, restore trust in the contemporary media? Well, we didn't break it. And in fact, quality journalism, I think, has never been more trusted. 
I think quality brands are actually probably at the peak of trust uh, as a result of the way that we go about what we do versus what they do. Uh, I think Campbell Reid, who from News who spoke this week, he called it there was a, there was a, a visibility and a viability problem. The visibility problem is trusted content, the tech titans like Google and Facebook and others are experts at making it invisible. Mm. Viability is that the advertising business model that supports quality journalism is being steadily eroded by the tech titans who are the world's most successful advertising platforms. Um, that's the equation we're dealing with. So, I mean, Tori, about the tech giants, what did you think of the Breitbart revelation yesterday about the the group meeting where everyone had a collective cuddle at, uh, at Google because Trump won. What do you think about um, when an organisation like that, where essentially they parade themselves as being a utility, but then something comes out about the political values of that utility? I do not buy the argument that somehow the algorithm of Google is biased one to one ideology or another. I know that there's plenty of people who I just haven't seen any evidence of that, and I don't, I don't understand how you're supposed to create an algorithm that does that, without it being, you know, incredibly obvious. And so I, look, whether they were hugging each other on that night, I, I don't think it's relevant. I think what's relevant is the content that they're serving up, and I haven't seen evidence that it's skewed. What do you think? Uh, well, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> I mean, I think the uh, algorithm. I mean, they say it's neutral and object objective, but why is it so pernicious in the way that um, it punishes, you know, quality journalism? I mean, it doesn't... It doesn't punish our well, quality journalism. Well, we do pretty yeah, well, well, well you're, you're in business with Google. Um, but, uh, and, you know, and maybe that's the right business model. But, um, but you know, we've been more cautious about that because um, the reality for us is the next step in this process beyond... Now, now first click free took 10 years, 10 years, to, um, to, uh, to, to lobby. Mm. And frankly, Robert Thompson, the Chief Executive of News Corp, uh, gave a speech yesterday and he said that Rupert Murdoch, Lachlan Murdoch and Robert Thompson were the digital Don Quixotes, tilting against the tech titan windmills. And he called it a soliloquy because it's only now that the chorus uh, is building from all other media against uh, you know, this, uh, this model. And the, and the reality is that First Click Free has now been, and, and of course some big billion uh, dollar euro fines in Europe and a regulation uh, potential here in terms of the ACCC inquiry have made them much more cooperative than they have been. But the next step, which has been alluded to by many people, is primacy of provenance. How do we reward in the hierarchy of content those, like the Herald, like the West Australian, like us, who originated the content, broke the story, and get the benefit from it. And a good example is a story you talked about just before, which is Barnaby Joyce. So the Daily Telegraph broke that story, arguably one of the biggest political stories uh, of the year, if not in some years, that ultimately led to the downfall of the Prime Minister. 400,000 Google searches in four weeks, and how much of it was attributed to the Daily Telegraph? 6.66%. Yes, the devil's number. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, that's the reality of the provenance of journalism. Until that changes, until that algorithm that, um, as Nicholas Gray said this week, uh, can actually make self-driving vehicles work, um, until that algorithm is altered to, to the benefit of all publishers, um, uh, you know, I'll reserve my judgment about the, um, about the algorithm. Well, so the, the lack of transparency around it is one of the things that, uh, that, that's got to be a concern for us. And, you know, we, we just don't know. We, we don't know the answers to these things. And, and th there's a lack of willingness, I think, to, um, to, to, to come clean on some of these things. And we, we discover later that, um, you know, that, that they're doing certain things. So I, I think it's a, it's a difficult thing. I think one of the proposals in front of the ACCC is to you know, have some sort of uh, look at the way that works. And I think that would be a, a, a good way for us to go. What about, I mean, the specificity of Facebook is worth talking about here, where um, Channel 2, as I call them, um, buy ads on Facebook as a way of promoting their own services. Um, I always have a philosophical issue with the idea of the public broadcaster purchasing ads. I agree. Simply because um, they own uh, an internet presence, a radio station network and a television network to all be able to inter-promote themselves. What do you feel about the role of, of, of how someone like the ABC who will claim that they're not trying to eat anyone's lunch um, is going to a company with significant uh, you know, tax issues, all the rest of it that we're talking about here, um, 
to promote itself. What do you think, Tors? I'm not a fan. I don't think the ABC should be spending money on Google and Facebook at all. Um, and look, there's a whole conversation to be had about the content that they're now producing in competition with, mm. um, with all of us and all the businesses that are trying to make, you know, have commercial success. And that's a whole other conversation. But I think it's pretty clear that it's, like, it's not a good use of our money, my money, your money, um, buying, like trying to create an audience for them that I, I don't believe it's in their charter. Because to me, uh, 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 again, Paul, it's this thing where if you have a million dollars and your organisation that supposedly is being you know, cut beyond the bone, you can spend a million dollars promoting the organisation or you can split it up and hire 10 people for 100 grand. Sure. And, and, and you know, it is really the ABC, the, the government funding situation, that isn't the other elephant in the room because we've got you know, the tech titans on one side ever expanding. I mean, a lot of people talk about Google and Facebook, but everyone should not forget the other big, big, big gorilla that's coming here, and that's Amazon. Um, you know, look at what happened in the book publishing industry in the United States. 99% of audio books, 83% of e-books, 45% of printed books, one in every two retail dollars, over 40% of every online retail search. And they're coming here. They're in content and streaming, and potentially news services uh, will be next. So with the ABC and SBS, you've got $1.3 in funding there, and as Tory says, they're competing in the space traditionally that our brands are in in terms of websites, uh, and obviously there's this uh, competitive neutrality inquiry that's going on, but it's just another... Uh, as you say, opportunistic uh, costs you have to look at in terms of where you put your resources. I, I might get to the content stuff in a second. By the way, if there's any questions, obviously throw up our hands in a second. I want to talk about internet outrage in a second, but um, after the, the joy of the past few weeks of politics, I wanted to ask you all about, uh, you know, you've all experienced for your whole careers uh, letters, complaints uh, about the, the political bias of the political reporting that exists in all the different places that you've worked. But I wanted to ask you, Brett, about as we increasingly need to feed multiple beasts, how big a danger it is, is it to the objectivity of any reporter to also write an opinion piece in the same day as they are writing a straight news story? Uh, I, I think as long as they're, they're separated and um, dealt with like that, I don't think it's, uh, it's a problem at all. And I think it's something that's been going on in our industry for you know, many, many years. Um, I, I think uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, people... I, I think the, the biggest thing is that we, we need to make sure that people understand the difference. Um, and because you, you're saying you, you're putting forward a certain view uh, doesn't necessarily mean that your reporting's invalid. I, I, I don't... But see... You all know that because, and most of the people in the room know that because of the process, all the rest. But to the vast number of people who'll send me an angry email of, aha, proven. Um, well, uh, I, I think, uh, Paul, that it, the opinion piece or the analysis uh, by political reporters is not the issue. I think it's tweeting. Because if you look at the gallery, you've got uh, you know, a whole range of people who are tweeting often, yeah. um, you know, supporting the progressive side of politics. Um, and mocking um, with derisiveness conservative politicians. Um, you've got this sort of activism that's infected the gallery, I think. I think as a political reporter, uh, you know, you you're, you're in a much stronger position in terms of how you're going to be treated by a politician if you arrive at the table without a preconceived view of where you stand. Mm. And I think that this is an issue in terms of a lot of younger members of the gallery that they're constantly tweeting, uh, you know, in this fashion. And I think, it, I think I can see in that circumstance why when politicians have their own shortcomings and failures, they're very quick to heap, uh, you know, criticism on media organisations. But as even our former Prime Minister has acknowledged previously, um, you know, uh, politicians complaining about the media, as Enoch Powell said, is like sailors complaining about the sea, rather futile. Yeah. Of course, uh, we were accused of running campaigns. He's showing that he's quite good at running one against his own party himself in the last couple of days. Yeah, I was going to say, powerful forces outside the parliament. What, the dude living in New York at the moment? <laughs> um, <laughs> Tory, what do you think Which about this? living in New York, by the way. Yeah, yeah correct. What, uh, what do you think about this idea that... I mean, again, you've got these... these Constant swirls that are about attacks on credibility. There's the, there's the, the, the sort of snarky business model of the media watchers. There's the noise of Twitter. There's the readers who will be frustrated. And it seems that all of that, I don't know how big or little it, it, it contributes to that overall issue I was talking about before, about how people are engaging and what they're trusting and all the rest of it here. But what's your view about 
a, a, a reporter based in a press gallery in Canberra or the state political reporters in Sydney, Melbourne, whatever, um, banging out the opinion piece at the end of the day about how rooted the government is and then running the straight news story the next day? Look, it's something that political journalists have been doing since as long as I can remember in newspapers and it was probably less complicated when it was just in newspapers because you'd have the news stories on the, the, in the front of the book and you'd have the opinion pages where you would put the opinion and in online it's very difficult to put these opinion pieces in the context of the reporting because you don't, you don't have a visual reference to say, well, why are you reading this bit? Why don't you have a, have a look at this as well? It, I think there's a difference between an analysis and opinion and I think that political reporters in Canberra serve a really valuable um, tool for our readers in analysing what has happened or, you know, the, the context of the issue and the politics around it and I don't think there's any problem with doing that. I agree, I'm not a big fan of all the Twitter stuff, partly because I think they should be serving our readers rather than the Twitter audience. Correct. And I think that the first question any editor or journalist should ask about whether or not to write something is, does this actually serve our audience yeah. and not someone else's audience? Well, and, and this is the thing too, that, that, that I'd love to know how all of you approach this idea about not just your work for our news organisation, but the people you are communicating with are the hundreds of thousands and potentially millions of people that are going to sit down and read the damn thing, rather than the people you're writing about meeting you in the corridor and tut tut tutting at you. Mm. Um, if you ha ever have a journalist who needs to be reminded of this, how does one do it? <laughs> well, normally privately. <laughs> uh, but, and look, most reporters, good reporters, they know when they've crossed the line and they know um, when they have to rein it in, um, normally without having to be told. Um, mo most people, they think about it carefully, can see how something could be interpreted by others, and, and in this day and age, people interpret it very quickly. Mm. Well, what's that thing, I mean, Brett, about how, how it works for everyone, but how does it work specifically in the West where, uh, is, is there any cultural difference that says, you know, it's not about I mean, they all know it's not about impressing ministers, but they don't go to work every day with the reader. They go to work every day in the yeah. ecosystem. It, of there's, there's probably is a, there's a, there's a challenge for us that's specific to Western Australia in that we're so far from Canberra uh, and uh, our, our reporters there, and we've only got a, a, a small, a very small team compared to these guys, but um, they're out of, out of them, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple who aren't um, from Western Australia and there are a couple who are. But um, it's, it, it is a difficult challenge because, uh, you know, and I say to them, look, you've got to get your heads around how this is being viewed from the other side of the country you know, and, and, and these sort of uh, thought patterns and, and, and us talking to them and telling them about how things are being viewed from our side of the country. Because, you know, mostly we don't have a lot of time for things that happen this side of the Nullarbor. Um, we, we, we're extremely cynical of it. Um, the West Australians uh, uh, would... You know, probably in a lot of uh, cases, and we've, uh, we've done surveys on this, we'd probably like to be our own country, and uh, as long as we can keep the SAS, um, we, we, <laughs> we'd be pretty right. But um, we, we, we've fought, I mean, we've fought the battle over that side of the country for, uh, you know, our fair share of the GST, for example, and you, you saw that uh, when you came to yeah. WA during the election campaign, you saw the, the, the passion amongst our, our readers. So it is something that we really, really... Uh, try and instill it in our people in Canberra is, well, hang on, that might be what's being said around the corridors, but uh, think about this in, uh, you know, in Perth or you know, in the Pilbara or in the Kimberley or in the South West. You know, we, we, we want people to think like that. Is there, uh, there questions for the panel? Whack your hand up, don't be afraid. Okay, cool. We've got a microphone uh, to someone down the front, but I, there's a question I wanted to ask you all before we get to this, which is online outrage and... Uh, the front page today of The Australian talking about sleeping giants and obviously I got skin in the game about them uh, pointing and screaming at, uh, at Sky News. I also found it really instructive that um, the analysis done by Sky News that it was you know, 200 accounts that were the ones making most of the noise. Now, it seems that, again, this ecosystem where if it seems big on Twitter, then it must be big, and it'll take a little while to respond to those things. But, Paul, 
how important is it that the relationship between organisation and its advertisers is one where you can tell them about the proportionality of the rage that's coming their way? Well, I think it's very important. I think you've got to look at it from both perspectives as well. When the social media pylon starts, and uh, I've been there a few times, uh, Bill Leake, etc. Uh, you know, it looks like, you know, I mean, advertisers, advertising agencies are, are saying that, you know, there's this huge backlash, you know, that's sweeping the country. And of course, we find out in the Sleeping Giant case that it might be a handful of people and a couple of bots yeah. um, that are driving it all. In our case, um, I think the other thing that advertisers should be, should be uh, mindful of is that just remember that a lot of people that read the Australian or the Sydney Morning Herald or the West Australian, they are consumers. That's why people advertise in these products. And uh, you know, we had a case where an advertiser, some 20-something uh, person in the social media department of this particular company had tweeted that uh, their advertising with the Australian was under review. And of course, when we actually went to check this, we discovered that that was news to the managing director. Wow. Um, and you just wonder uh, whether companies have got a strong enough handle on what's going out on social media. Obviously, they're being besieged and they're trying to respond to it. But just remember that a lot of the consumers that use their products are our readers. And I can guarantee you, in that case, that there were our readers in Queensland who were ringing this company to cancel their policies Good. Um, in protest. So I think advertisers have to think about it very carefully. Like, not every case is going to be sleeping giant. There's obviously going to be some cases where there is genuinely a backlash that takes place. But I think you've got to think about it very carefully in terms of your brand and where you sit, because a lot of people that are loyal to our products are our readers and they're, they're consumers. I also think that, you know, Tori, part of this too is, is that when people decide to advertise on... Um, you know, in, in and around our brands or a talkback radio station or something, they are buying into an environment that's not just spots and dots thing by the side of the road. That's like it is people that are totally locked in. So the decision to sort of pull that apart because of people who may have never purchased the product but just have joined in today's, you know, you're the worst person in the world. What's your view of, of either how specifically Sleeping Giants plays out or the online outrage when it starts to affect your advertising? Well, I think what happens pretty quickly, and this, and this has happened with your network, is that there might be advertisers who set their hair on fire for a week, but they're back on, on air two weeks later. Um, so I think that, yes, they need to be more careful, and, but you tend to find that the long-term damage from these things is probably about as equal to the level of kind of sound and fury from a small number of people at the time. Is it your... I mean, hey, if a campaign like this started to come towards you, is it the view that the company needs to stand, fight, push back, or because it does seem that there are certain moments where companies turn around and say, well, what did we get wrong? Let's double-check everything here, rather than saying, well, hang on, mm -hmm. this isn't quite coming from a place of, of, of true judgement about what we're doing, more so a vague, you know, a, a hit and run. I just think, from a, purely from a newsroom perspective, because I don't have a lot to do with the business side of it, is that it's really important to defend the journalism. And that can really help. You know, when you're under attack over a story, it's really important for the masthead to stand up for that story and explain to people why it was legitimate, why it was correct, and that can help a lot. What about defending things that are, Brett, um, line ball calls? And I'll ask you all, obviously, about the Mark Knight cartoon this week. I think the Herald Sun's response was awesome. Um, I, I loved it. But those moments when there's, there's, there's a judgment about whether something is too hot or not, I mean, somebody's made the call, mm. it's going to go in. Um, but either you thought it was too hot or the majority of the room thought it was too hot, these sorts of things. Um, should it work like the Labor Party, where it's caucus and defend at all times? Well, I don't, newsrooms don't work like that. Um, there, there's certainly a, a range of opinions in a newsroom, but uh, in the end, uh, someone has to make a call, and it's usually one of us up here, and uh, you, you've, got to, you, you've got to stand by that in the end. Uh, I think, you know, and, and I think Boris said this earlier, that the fact that uh, you know, you, you've got an outlet there that if uh, there are a vast number of different views as, on something that you've done, uh, I think you, you're, you should be big enough to be able to publish some of those different mm. views on what you've done as well. And I think that that's something that, uh, you know, mainstream media, um, all the publications that we uh, 
uh, represent do all the time. You know, it's, it's not just, um, you know, oh, here's our view and we'll defend it and we won't hear anyone else. And I think that's something that uh, if you rewind it and have a look at what happens on, uh, you know, on online in a lot of places, well, it's just like this complete pile on all just one, one view and that's it. Well, and, and it's, but it's this thing too, Tori, again, when, you know, I'm, I'm not to speak for Sky News, but our, our situation where, you know, trying to educate a certain part of the population that, uh, you know, I'm only in charge of two hours a day, uh, not the whole damn thing. There's somebody doing one hour. That, you know, everyone's very much aware of the sectors and silos of a, of a newspaper, but not quite uh, telly yet. What's your view about something like how you defend, how you respond when internet starts to be outrageous about something you decided to publish? Well, it would depend a lot on what it was. I mean, if it's... If the issue is over the facts, then you have to represent the facts over and over. Um, if it's an issue of taste or personal opinion, like it was with the Mark Knight cartoon, then you know I, I guess you have to make an editorial decision about whether you're going to defend it or back down, um, because those things are entirely subjective. And as I said before, I think you. It's important to stand up and defend your decisions. Or if you have, if you make the judgment that you've got it wrong, say you got it wrong. But of course, the pressure from the internet is to scream at you to make you mm. think you've got it wrong. Mm. Mm. Um, it, it, how does one deal with that? Well, I often use the first barometer as the readership. I know almost, I wouldn't say instantly, but I know fairly quickly once we publish something that I've, we've either overstepped the mark or we've taken a position that is totally out of kilter with the expectation of our readership. So I find that a very useful barometer. I mean, we get hundreds of emails a day with letters, etc., comments, and pretty much fairly soon you know where you are. I think with the Mark Knight cartoon, for instance, sometimes a cartoon like that would be published, and, and I, I've, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to Mark Knight's position in that he had no, I don't think he had any anticipation that that would be the reaction, certainly not a worldwide reaction. And it's like, you know, you have to address these things uh, as they confront you. Uh, with Bill Leak, I can tell you there were a number of cartoons uh, that I rejected. Uh, you know, Bill would, as the editor-in-chief, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily do the, uh, you know, the actual first interaction with him over what his thinking was for the day, but I'd obviously see the end product or the end couple of choices that there were. Um, and he'd say to me, you know, uh, do you think we can get away with this one? And I'd say, well, uh, you know, if you mean we're not going to have a hate campaign on Twitter, a, um, you know, a, a, an organised uh, campaign by GetUp to, uh, to target all our advertisers, yeah, press council complaint, a human rights complaint and a legal action, uh, you know, probably not. But uh, I think it's probably OK. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I think... And, 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 and you know, it's not, well, I'm, I'm not the fondable knowledge. Like, I will run a cartoon by several senior editors um, you know, at, at different ages or whatever, just to get their view of what they think of it before we make a final decision. Mm. Oh, I've got about 10 minutes for questions, so let's get into it now. Just wondering the panel's thoughts on defamation laws in Australia, not just to how they apply to your publications, but also who they apply to in the broader context and who's responsible for content that goes on Facebook and Google. We don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> well... Uh, the, the, defa the defamation laws in the, this country are, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a difficult beast and not necessarily uh, overly accessible to the ordinary person. Uh, we've seen, you know, the high profile cases uh, play out and, um, but uh, I, I think, you know, that the generally we're, we're not massive fans of, uh, of, of the defamation laws. Um, what was the second part? Uh, who how they apply to new entrants into the market, like... Facebook and Google. Yeah. Well, they don't, unfortunately. Well, they don't, yeah. yeah which is a which is all the first problem. amendment. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. like the taxation problem yeah. that we have with the, those companies. And I, well. I think until that's truly tested, I think a lot of us are probably hedging our bets on that too, because, you know, I... So, I, before I was at Fairfax, I was working for Huffington Post, which is a global news organisation, and a head office had a lot of they really failed to understand a lot about our legal restrictions here because they just couldn't believe it. I mean, they, they had a platform defence in the US on defamation on their blogs. So if you signed up to be a blogger, you, you took on the legal responsibility for that. Whereas, of course, here, all of our blogs had to be edited and we had to take responsibility for it. And so that in their view, 
we would have a platform defence about anything that we put on, that went on Facebook, that it would be Facebook's problem, not our problem. But I don't think it's fully been tested here. Right. But I'd like to talk about the first part of the question. Yeah. So the defamation laws in Australia are a joke. Um, but while you've got 40% of the parliament being lawyers, they're not likely to be changed anytime soon. <laughs> um, one of the biggest issues for publishers in this environment where advertising's under pressure, the funding model for journalism is under pressure like never before, we have to make commercial decisions. Uh, you know, we do have to make decisions about which cases we're going to fight and which ones we're going to surrender. Of course, the problem is, um, in my view, is security of costs. Every person in Australia who, f who feels that they've been defamed, normally they're told that they've been defamed by ambulance chasing lawyers who yes. circle their names in the newspaper. Yes. And they're suddenly very outraged about uh, this, uh, the gr with grievances about what occurred to them. These lawyers uh, take it on spec. Um, they just try to push us to the line to make a commercial decision to write a cheque. Um, and if we did that every time, we'd be writing a lot of cheques. So we have to pick which cases we're going to fight. But the reality is, and the best case I can give it of is one the Australian was involved in, uh, a fellow called uh, Captain Dragon, Serbian alleged war criminal, uh, who ultimately uh, was found guilty and it went through the courts uh, in, uh, in Croatia. But we spent, as a newspaper, $2.7 million. We, we were sued. This fellow had no money. Uh, we, went to, we, we had to fight a war crimes trial, effectively, in the civil jurisdiction of the New South Wales Supreme Court. And the judge found for us. We, found, we sent six lawyers to uh, overseas to gather evidence because the nation state of Croatia, under the terms of the prosecution, were not able to share any of the material they'd gathered. We mounted our own war crimes investigation to defend this matter. It went to the, court, uh, the Supreme Court and we won. It went to the Court of Appeal, which was the first time we got security of costs, where he had to produce the evidence that he could actually pay for it. And then it went to the, uh, you yeah, know, he sought leave to the High Court. Um, but we spent an inordinate amount of money. Now, would we do that again? Probably not. Well, I hope we could, but I don't know because, and, and who's the loser in that? It's the general public, because, um, you yeah, the public should have the right to know who lives amongst us. Um, and we had to spend, like I say, an inordinate amount of money. Even when you win, win, yeah. you lose, because the costs are so extraordinary. And the capping of defamation payouts, as some of you might have read uh, today involving uh, the Jones matter, um, well, it, it appears increasingly that uh, the cap's not applying. Um, and I don't talk to that case. I just say that, um, you know, uh, it's very expensive, and we have to make, ultimately, decisions in the best interest of protecting the product, i.e. we don't want to be writing cheques for millions of dollars to people. Let's, uh, let's roll some questions. If you've got anything specific for anyone uh, that's called cool to, just say what your name is before we get a microphone or when we get a microphone in your hand. Darren from the Australian. Dorothy, um, Dixon, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> my question is the honourable um, member for the boss. A <laughs> yeah. uh, question for everyone on the panel and, and my boss, Paul. Um, Facebook is the world's biggest publisher, 2.2 billion users. YouTube, effectively the world's biggest TV network, 1.8 billion monthly users. Those networks are riddled with extremist, illegal content, inappropriate content. Facebook's facing charges in the UK for, hold, for hosting child pornography. Are agencies, advertisers, and online activists like Sleeping Giants failing to apply the same standard to those networks? Well, that's a very pertinent question there, uh, Dan. Uh, I mean, the point is that, you know, well, it is an interesting point. I mean, the, so it's Channel 7, Sky News 2GB, on the back foot trying to defend a matter with the sleeping giants and their army of bots coming at them. But no problem uh, having uh, this character Blair on uh, Facebook or YouTube or any manner of uh, hate speech that's out there. Absolutely no problem for the agencies and being co-located with the advertising there. And I don't see how they're any different. Uh, you know, I don't see how there should be a different standard applied to us as applied to them. And I think, um, you know, they, they desperately don't want to be publishers, but I think ultimately they're going to have to be. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> that was quick. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> well, I, I, and, I think, and I think this is, this is where this, the, the, the ACCC process is really important. And, you know, this is where at the end of this we, we are going to have to at least see something that, that, that'll put... I'm not a massive fan on control in any form of the media, but reality is, particularly when you look at the broadcasting industry, I mean, there, there are you know, wide-ranging controls on what can be broadcast. Now, if, I, I agree with Boris. If they, they're not 
they are publishing. They've got to be treated as publishers and be, you know, face all the same regulations that we do. All right, another question. One over here, up the back. Uh, my name is uh, Kors Hussum from the Netherlands. I've got a question here. Um, Apple Corporation acquired Texture, as you probably know, being partly owned by News Corp. Um, so Apple News is going to be rolled out big time. Nobody today mentioned uh, Apple News or Apple as a big player. Can I maybe ask the, uh, the people to give some reaction about their thoughts about Apple News? Well, Troy, we'll start with Apple News. How big is it going to be? How do you work with it? In, in, in Apple News in general or Apple News application in yeah. Australia? So well, I missed the start of your question. Well, Texture was being owned by six large publishing companies like Meredith and Rogers and, and as well as News Corp. And they sold the company to Apple just a few weeks down right. the road. Right. OK. Sorry, I'm not really across that. But I can talk about the fact that we are Is obviously that... publishing on Apple News and we're getting huge reach there. And um, I, it's, it's another platform for people to reach us. Is it, does it work differently than Facebook in terms of algorithms, what it uses, what it demands yeah, from you as a publisher? It does. And also, they're very, um, they interact with us about the content. No, they have editors. But they don't recognise yep. provenance. The, all the cheap, all the rewritten Daily Mail stuff surfaces at the top and the premium uh, subscription content is down the bottom and good luck finding it. And the Apple News business model is that you, you work with their model or you don't work with it. Yeah, 100%. All right, uh, another question. I've got time for probably two more really quick ones. All right, let's get a microphone over here. Uh, hi, question for the panel. Uh, my name's Julian. Um, Question on loyalty to content, um, just using examples like the cartoon that we've seen, the backlash for that, um, Sky News potentially losing customers or advertisers, but also breaking the Barnaby story and getting a lot of readership in that. Where does the content loyalty lie in terms of loyalty to the truth and the fact and then positive results with the Barnaby story or loyalty to potential advertiser backlash and content? Well, well, where, where we, see, we, we see it as loyalty to our readership, yeah. I would think. Um, that's, that's, that's where our loyalty, number one loyalty lies, is uh, the editorial um, uh, areas of our, our businesses. Is that what, yeah. Is that but what the first mean? loyalty to the facts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so. Facts first, yeah. Yeah, facts first. But then with result like um, loyalty to the facts with the Barnaby story obviously had a positive result, but then loyalty to the facts with the Sky story had a negative response. Where's that line get drawn? About what content to back about and its potential backlash. That's such a moment. Yeah, I wouldn't, moment I wouldn't say consideration of a potential backlash is where we spend most of our day thinking. Do you think too many people do, though? Do you think that the authors of backlash think that you're obsessing about backlash all day long? <laughs> <laughs> they hope, they, they'd like to believe we Yeah, I, not a lot of my time spent worrying about no. that. And, and then you know, dealing with it when it happens is what we do, but uh, in, in the, at the start of the process, it isn't where you, where you come from. You never Absolutely do anything, not. If that's what no, you'd be sitting there. It's always going to offend somebody. Sort of quivering in the corner, never actually being able to publish anything, wouldn't you? Well, because, I mean, this is, this is you know, the intoxicating thing about the spirit of what you guys do and, and, and the people that you are, but, you know, it, it feels at times like there are people who live in fear of the line, there are people who enjoy putting their foot all the way over it. Do you think that, that in 2018 it's harder to push the line of whatever it is, good taste, good this, good that, um, when there is this, this immediate screaming mob that seems to be there? Because it feels like on sort of the parts it's of the in, media they don't even want to push it, the line. It's in the back of your mind, I think you've got to be honest about that, mm -hmm. um, and you could not, you, you, you'd hope to come to work the next day and spend 14 hours on concentrating on the next day's edition and the 50 other iterations, rather than having to be dealing with a backlash. I can't say that that doesn't enter your mind on some occasions, but ultimately I think we uh, pursue the story fearlessly and without favour, pretty much. Um, and um, that's the way we tackle it from a first principles program. I think some of the movement in that line is really positive, though. I mean, there's things that were published 20 years ago without any backlash whatsoever that were horribly misogynistic, horribly racist, and 
mm. now, you wouldn't get away with that without a backlash. And I don't think anyone would argue that you should be able to just be horribly misogynistic and horribly racist without anyone complaining about it. Uh, but I don't think journalists and, well, no successful journalists and editors spend all day worrying about upsetting people. I know I'm 90 seconds over, and I should have asked this question at the start, but I'll go to it anyway. Um, what about your role when the backlash is about somebody else in amplifying the impact of backlash? How do you make that judgment, Brett, about, yep, this big thing's happening where everyone's yelling at this thing, when the truth of the people yelling at it could be, you know, half a dozen people with their bots that's yelling at it, yet by the prominence that you've put it in the paper or online, its impact becomes louder and louder and bigger and bigger and uh, becomes in many ways more legitimate than it should be. Yeah, I think we have to be cautious about that. And, and I think, you know, take this week, for example, the Mark Knight um, cartoon, we took a position on that in the West Australian. We were supportive of, uh, of the idea that the, the Herald Sun published that cartoon. I also thought their front page the next day was brilliant. Uh, and I, I, I've got a feeling that uh, the, the, the more that this type of backlash, the, the confected backlash, the people who are outraged for outrage's sake, I, I, I feel that the more that gains hold, the more we as mainstream media will be galvanised to push back, to push the line and to, to not be as concerned about um, you know, being fearful of it. I think that we uh, have to be the custodians of, uh, of, of certain things and we, we are, as an industry, uh, we need to in, in some way support each other and push back when uh, against the whole backlash culture. Tori, you get the last word on the same question. Well, I think the first thing you need to do is go to the original source and ask them, you know, put their side of it too. Um, it's a legitimate reporting on a big, like, it was a legitimate news story to report on the response to the night cartoon. Um, our, we just played it very straight, um, including, you know, putting the Herald Sun's position in the story. Um, I don't think we inflamed the situation in any way by doing that. All right, guys, thank you very much, one and all. I appreciate uh, your time. Thank you, everyone.